Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews, where we are delving deep into the pressing issues that shape our municipalities across Canada. And now today, we bring you the latest update from Cypress County, Alberta, as they have just declared a state of agricultural disaster for the third consecutive year. Now, despite a promising start to the growing season, the hardworking farmers and ranchers of Cypress County are facing an uphill battle. Not enough rain, coupled with relentless heat waves, have left their marks on the land, resulting in poor soil conditions. But that's not all. An army of grasshoppers has descended upon the county, wrecking havoc on the already struggling agricultural sector. Now, the Alberta Crop Report paints a somber picture, with a significant portion of the south part of the province showing either poor or fair soil moisture ratings as of June 27, 2023. In fact, the estimated soil moisture in Cypress County is the lowest it has been in over a half a century. Now, faced with these dire circumstances, Cypress County took swift action. On June 29th, a fire ban was imposed to mitigate the risk posed by the arid conditions. And just two days earlier, the Agricultural Service Board meeting recommended declaring a state of disaster for the county. Now, Cypress County is not alone in this struggle. Many rural municipalities across Alberta, including Stetler, Paint Earth, Foothills and Vulcan have already declared an agricultural state of disaster this year. The situation demands attention as the consequences reach far beyond the borders of these affected regions. The decisions to declare a state of agricultural disaster is about more than just raising awareness. It serves as a plea for assistance from the provincial and federal governments. Now, without their support, agricultural businesses could face closures and challenges within the food chain, threatening the future of our food supply. Now, today, we have the privilege of speaking with Cypress County's own Ward 9 Councillor, Keith Ritz, to shed light on the state of the agricultural sector in southeast Alberta. We will explore the hardships faced by the resilient farmers and ranchers of the area and learn about the hopes and expectations of Cypress County. Now, stay with us as we delve into the critical issue, seeking answers and exploring solutions for the heartland that sustains us all. Councillor, I want to start with the big question here. I want to start with the recent declaration from Cypress County Council about declaring a agricultural state of disaster for the county of the for Cypress County. And I want from you, and I want to know from you, what was the catalyst that led to the county to make this declaration? 
I I think probably the the biggest um, catalyst was the fact that in the month of May and June we have received very low percentage of our normal rainfall. I'd say that's probably the biggest catalyst. What what's that meaning? So for those who aren't agricultural farmers who are listening to this right now or watching this later on, what does the lack of rain mean for farmers? Because I'm assuming that means crops aren't uh, crops aren't growing. That means that uh, fields are being left barren because the soil conditions aren't uh, favorable to their uh, produce that they're trying to grow. So the way it affects you, first of all, um, if you have May, May is is a is a month normally where you you um, have had uh, fairly good spring moisture in terms of snowpack and moisture uh, absorbed into the soil or running off, and then in June, which is traditionally our rainy month is when the crops really get going. And combined May and June is when a lot of native grasses uh, actually do the majority of their growing. Uh, some, some of those species are basically done and have set seed by June 15th. So you really, spring moisture is real important to those native grasses. What, what are and, some types of native grasses out there? Oh. Like are we are, are we talking about like actual seeds that are planted or are we talking about actual grass? No, this is this is native seed that reseeds itself. Native okay. grasses that reseed themselves. No, that's what I thought. I just wanted to double check that I got my information correct that I was reading because yeah. you never know with some of the stuff that you read on the internet sometimes. Yeah. So well, the you, you do have you do have a lot of improved pasture what we call improved pasture, which is uh, stuff that we seed. So, you know, you uh, for land that people have decided not to farm anymore, they want to go more into cattle, then they will reseed that to grasses that will be productive for cattle grazing. So at the end of the month, in June, on June 27th, 2023, the Alberta Crop Report released their uh, their weekly report, and it said mm -hmm. that 32.1% of the land in southern Alberta, which is where Cypress County resides, is in poor condition. 427 is in fair condition. Good, 24.4. And this is the most staggering one. The the air, the surface soil moisture for 0.8% of the southern Alberta area is in excellent condition for growing. Are farmers and ranchers worried? Because this is the third straight year that Cypress County has had to declare a agricultural state of disaster. This doesn't bode well for the future of the agricultural sector in southern Alberta, does it? No, it doesn't. Um Everything that I've looked at, um, it kind of becomes like a big chess game. There's there's a number of factors that I've looked that have led up to this, and depending on how it plays out, has different ripple effects. And um, I don't want to be an alarmist, and I don't want to declare that the doom and gloom, but there are definitely some some um some challenges ahead but and, the reality the, is that it's not just the fact not just uh cypress county that should be worried about this this is all of alberta and even all of canada that should be worried about this issue because our food comes from your area yeah yeah there's there's no doubt it's not a it's not a cypress county problem it's it's really a, a provincial problem and it and because there is so much beef um, processed in this part of the province, it, it really, I, I think in my, from my perspective, it's a national pro, it's a national problem, but it's really hard to um, envision that 
when you're living in a city. You know, your food comes on the, on the shelf. It's always there. Uh, we always be able to buy whatever we want at any time of the year. And the fact that um, we take we take that for granted uh, should not be. I mean, it was, you know, I go back. You'd take a hundred years ago when our foreigners came and opened this country up. There was no guarantees. And there was no grocery store to go buy whatever you wanted at. You raised it off the land. And uh, we sometimes take that for granted that they worked really hard and our fathers worked really hard. And we now um, enjoy a lot of things that they didn't have. And food is one of them. But let's not take food for granted. I mean, um, I've seen some really good crops. And I've seen years where I didn't take the combine out. What are you hearing from farmers and ranchers right now? Because I'm assuming you're hearing from your neighbors. You're, you're a farmer yourself. And I'm assuming yeah. you're hearing from the people of your community of the trials and tribulations that they're going through with the yeah. lack of rainfall, the bad soil conditions. What are you hearing from the farmers and ranchers in Cypress County today about this issue and their their outlook on the next year or even two years as we've talked about? Well, um, from a from a personal point of view, and I think my story could be duplicated, okay? But if I speak personally, then it's my story. Yeah. So what I am looking at, and I I look at, first of all, we went into last fall extremely dry. Okay, we didn't have a lot of rainfall in the last half from July 1st on. So and we didn't have the fall moisture, so we went into the winter extremely dry. We had snow early. Uh, November 1st, we had our first snowstorm. Uh, our grazing basically got covered up with a snowfall, and we had to start feeding. Okay, so we fed for six months, which virtually eliminated our feedstock fence. You know our feed supplies so we were looking to get onto grass early it didn't happen first of all our snowpack uh like i told the council yesterday the snowpack did not translate into a good runoff we filled most of our dugouts some did not so there was really very little of that snowpack translated into spring moisture for crops we got a couple early showers. Um, we put the crop in. But by June 9th, when I was done seeding, it was already getting dry. So wow. I, I determined at that point, on June 9th, that I was not going to spray my crops with the in-crop spray that I normally follow up with. Because I said, I'm going to wait for rain. The weeds weren't growing anyway. And it was still, we had some cold days. We had frost one day in June. And so some of this, I just, things were slow to start. The grass was slow to start. Um, we were feeding late. And so I just said, you know what? I'm not going to spray until it rains. And I still haven't sprayed because it still hasn't rained. So you know, we had those couple of showers early, it got things going to a good start, but it did not sustain for very long because we didn't have good soil reserves, moisture reserves. So that's that's kind of what set this up for, for May and June. So, and um, when you look at, I follow the forecast because I did most of the spraying before we seeded. So I follow the radar, I follow the long-term forecast, I follow the daily forecast, I follow the wind, follow the humidity, the temperature, because all that relates to spring, right? And um, I noticed eh, mid-May, mid end of May, 
I said, there's no general rains. Every time I look at the radar, it's all showers. There's no general rain. Then I got thinking back to when I was, you know, when I was a kid, we had general rains that covered southern Alberta. And everybody got a rain. Yeah. And everybody got the same amount of rain. That hasn't happened for two or three years now. It's always showers. It can shower here, six miles away, it won't, you won't get a drop. Six miles away, they get an inch and a half. I come home to dust. And so um our our moisture um is 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 um very sporadic and so that you know if you get the showers you're okay if you don't you're 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 dry so in, so I, 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 I want I want to just jump in here for a second because I want to be the pessimist and I want to be the optimist in the in the room okay. here and I want to ask the uh, the million dollar question that I think I need to ask and I apologize if it comes out of left field here Keith okay but what happens if this doesn't change if if the weather doesn't cooperate if the soil doesn't become more uh, nutrient for your crops what happens to small businesses in the agriculture sector in Cypress County? And I know, and I want to just stick with you just because I know you are a rancher. So uh, yeah. what would happen to your farm if this doesn't turn around here in a year's time, heck, even six months time? Because I'm assuming when the soil is in a, such a bad condition, you're not getting the financial rewards from planting those crops and selling those crops compared to what you were three, four, five, even 10 years ago. Yeah. So what I'm looking at today is, and I'm hearing this from my neighbors, that the crops are not going to make even feed. Some guys are bailing their feed now way premature to keep ahead of the grasshoppers the grasshoppers which i wanted to which i want to talk about in a few seconds after you've done this statement yeah. because i know that's a big issue because i was just out in cypress county and i've never seen that many grasshoppers ever <laughs> <laughs> well so so for me i'm i'm kind of the optimist i'm you know i'm waiting for the miracle to happen and i'm going to write it out for a couple more weeks and see if we can't get these crops to where I can bale some of them. Some of them I know that if I come, if I cut them down, I will not bale them up because they're too short. I know that already. They're just, you know, they're just peaking above last year's stubble. So they're too short. If I cut them down, they're going to drop down there. They're going to dry up for a day or two, and you won't pick them up. And Virtually the cows won't pick them up either because they're laying right on the ground. And so, but I'm hoping that some of it will make green feed. If it doesn't, then you, we are looking at buying feed. And so importing feed from other locations around Alberta yeah. or even the Canada, bringing it in and supplementing the feed that you should be able to grow yourself. That's right. Because normally we we hay enough acres and grow enough cropland that we do not have to buy. So that represents a huge feed bill. You know, um, on top of all the other bills that you're getting from the federal government, oh yeah. provincial government, and even the county. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's the way it is. That's just life. We, we deal with it. But uh, yeah, this is a big deal because, um, you know, and I'm not going to put numbers out there because that, that's known in the industry, but it costs uh, many hundreds of dollars to feed a single animal for the winter. And, um, you know, you multiply that by the average herd of 150 or 200 or 300 and some guys got up to 700 that's a huge huge bill 
So what does it mean for the average guy? If we have another year like this, you will see a lot of cows go to town. And that has certain ripple effects on long-term viability of the food chain. Well, I, I, I know for uh, in Caribou Regional District in British Columbia, the only reason I know this is because it just popped up in my news feed uh, a few, like literally about 20 minutes before jumping on this call. Um, a lot of BC farmers are suffering the same exact issues that you are right now mm-hmm. and their grain and they're selling their cattle at auction because they they just won't be able to afford it throughout the winter which is yeah. then going to in turn hurt them in the long run because what their livelihood was is now being sent to uh, a major corporation or another farmer who may be able to feed their stock and that does impact negatively on them. But I want to talk about the grass. So go ahead. Go ahead before I talk about the grasshoppers here. Okay. So um, it's one thing if, these cows are going to another ranching operation. It'll be a totally different result if the cows that we sell now go to the slaughter because our mother cows are disappearing. And that, I see that, I've seen it and it concerns me because I go, the mother cow is what sustains our industry. If we lose our mother cows because of drought, we have a much bigger issue on our hands because there goes your family farm. Are we at the tipping point? Are we at the, and I hate to be, I hate to ask that question, but are we at a point right now where that is a real concern for a lot of farms right now? I think for some, maybe. But others, Um, you're a little bit optimistic. Yeah, we're still optimistic. I think we've got ways and means to, Remember, farmers and ranchers are innovative people. <laughs> they certainly are. They, they they will they will scratch at everything to survive, and they will come up with solutions. Uh, whether they're politically correct or not, they will come up with solutions, and hopefully, it will keep them viable out of this drought. I I, I I'm optimistic that we can weather it, but by the same token, um, if we get another couple dry years or even one more dry year or even a dry winter, uh, everything starts to really snowball in a different direction. I want to talk about something that we've mentioned a few times here, and that's the grasshopper situation down in Cypress County. Like I said, I was just recently there. I sat down, I had the pleasure to sit down with one of your council colleagues, Councillor Robin Kirpiewit. I'm going to pronounce his name wrong here, but Robin, as I'll say. Um, and when I was out, uh, he was giving me a tour of Cypress County and I couldn't believe how many grasshoppers were in the area. It is probably the weirdest thing I have ever seen. Uh, I've never seen that many grasshoppers. Does the the explosion of the grasshopper population hurt farmers as well, especially in this dry, un, uh, sort of manageable soil condition that they're seeing right now? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You have. Um, we're blessed here because we have pockets of grasshoppers but not a widespread infestation yet. Now, dry weather uh, seems to encourage grasshoppers to grow. So uh, I was just talking to a a rancher friend of mine over at uh, Schuler, Vineloss, that area over there, closer to the Saskatchewan border. And he said he's bailing up his green feed before the grasshoppers get it. I know other ranchers over there, the farmers, uh, they've sprayed four times for grasshoppers and quit because they were losing the battle. And basically, one of our counselors said yesterday, they're eating his trees and his flowers, everything in the yard. They're just eating it up. So it it's it's fairly disheartening when you hear stuff like that because uh, there's nothing you can do. You know, you can't spray enough to kill them all. Now, 
<clears throat> I want to talk about the innovation that farmers and ranchers are sort of uh sort of have in their hearts. And you mm-hmm. mentioned that farmers and ranchers are very innovative. And I want to talk mm-hmm. about working together, the collaboration approach that farmers have, because while it is a uh, one farm in, uh, versus not one farm in another farm, this is Cypress County. Are the farmers and ranchers of your community working together to try and solve these issues right now? Because I can imagine far, my farmland is my farmland. Your farmland is your farmland. But at the end of the day, if I don't work, if your farm doesn't work and my farm does, I, I want to help out my neighbor and in, in the farming community, I know there is a very much a neighbor helping neighbor at, uh, attitude towards helping each other out. Are you seeing that in Cypress County when it comes to these issues that are facing the farming sector? Well, I think, um, I think you, you can only see you, you can't you can only help a certain amount. You can't help out fully. You can't be like have my land, no. be, then you can grow your crop because you have to grow your crop as well. But is there yeah. innovative ways that people are helping out each other? Uh, they're sharing information. Yeah, and at this point, uh, they're they're exploring options, and as much as it will fit the individual operation you will employ those options. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, a shortage of feed and everybody suffers a shortage of feed, I'm not sure what the solution will be. We'll work, you know, like I said, it's it's one of those things we're living in the middle of it and we don't see, we don't see a lot of options open but we will explore everyone that we do see. So I want to go go ahead and finish up that statement. Then I'll ask my last question here, Keith. That could be um, finding, finding somewhere else for your cows to go while you maintain ownership. In 2001, uh, we were facing the same kind of spring and I sent my cows to Manitoba. And um, some of them stayed there for seven years. So, like, there's possibilities and there's options, depending on what suits your management style and what suits your operation. So, I want to end on this question, Keith, and I want this is this is a, a the wrap up question that I want to get on the table here. What do you want the average Albertan who's listening to this, who's watching this right now to know about what's going on in Cypress County and why it should be not only important to, and we've talked about it a little bit, but I want you to go more in depth here, why it's not just important to the people of Cypress County, but why it should be important to the people of Fort McMurray, to the people in Calgary, to the people in Edmonton, heck, to the people in Saskatchewan and even Manitoba who might be listening to this. Why why should people care about what's happening in Cypress County? And I'm not trying to be rude about that question. I think it's just the most important question that I can ask. It's important because it's about the sustainability of your future food. If 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 our food supply is jeopardized, then where do you go? It's like a, I've often compared it to when the wheels fall off the bus, it's too late. So we have a problem. We're working at our end to come up with solutions. We're not saying government bail us out. Let's look collaboratively to work toward a solution that will benefit us all and will uh, keep the cow herd intact and keep them grazing on the land. We do need rain for that, but that's that's your ultimate goal is to keep the operation functional so that food supply is not disrupted. What I, what I produce today, when I turn my bulls out with my cows today, that's a calf next year, 
That's your food two years from now or three years from now. Or it becomes a mother cow that produces your food six years from now. So every calf crop is important. Every time we do an operation, the, the wheat that I plant this spring, if I don't harvest it, there's that much less wheat this fall. Whereas, you know, then you have to either import as a country, you have to, and, and I, I mean, there, there's no easy answer here. But I just, yeah, I think, I think people of the cities need to realize that your food does not magically appear on the store shelf. There has been years of work gone into providing that food so that you can buy it off the shelf. I mean, we see it because we live it. Uh, when I, when, when, when you, when you work with a cow herd, it's interesting because I, uh, I was one of the ranchers that lost my cows at TB in 2016. And, and our herd was gone. We had to start over. And at first I didn't believe it, but it takes about 20 to 25 years to build up a cow herd that's yours if you have to start from scratch. And I didn't really believe it until I thought back to my own history. And I'd, I'd made a switch 25 years ago to a certain type of cow. And I was at that 25 year mark or very close to it when I lost my cows to TB. And then I started over. So for us to face that again, if we lose our cow herd now, uh, some of us are too old to come back into the game. And who's going to pick up that tap? Who's going to produce the food that you need to eat five years from now? You know, chickens have a very quick turnover time. Cows don't. Yeah. And and, and I, so I, I truly love food. my ground beef there, uh, Keith. So <laughs> I, I really hope it doesn't happen, to be honest. Well, that's that's really that's the heart and soul of I farm and my family farms because we enjoy a way of life. But we have to be we you know, we have to make a living at it too. Right? And what we do today, that's the problem with this in a sense, is what we do today, you don't see the results for two years. Yeah. It has to the animal has to grow up. The animal has to get fed. The animal has to get fattened, slaughtered so that you can eat it. And that's a, a minimum of two-year process. So, you know, what is what do the average city people, the average person in Alberta need to know? This this concerns them because this this is your food two years from now. And if you throw it away or don't care about it, okay, but I do. You know, Keith, thank you so I much for this. Oh, no, and you, you you said it perfectly. I wanna I wanna just follow up on one of the analogies you you used. You said you don't you you don't want to fix a bus after the wheels fallen off. You want to fix the bus while the wheel's still on. Yeah. How close are we? How close are we to that wheel falling off? Is it two years? Is it a year? Is it next year? I can't, I can't honestly tell you that. I don't really know because I, I'm not in tune with enough of the industry. But, and there are those that are much more in tune with the industry that could tell you how close we are. I tend to think we're only, you know, if it started, if it started to rain, uh, we're, we're going to start recovery. If it don't rain till September, uh, this is going to get a lot worse. And and that I can't. So there's some things I can't tell you because I don't know. I appreciate your honesty, though, there, though, because yeah. I think that's the best thing. But Keith, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. And it's an honor to have you on the show. And uh, I know thoughts and prayers are thrown around a lot here, but I do hope that uh, Cypress County does see the rain. Uh, to quote CCR and <laughs> Clarence uh, uh, CCR who uh, who stopped the rain I really hope it does start raining out there for you because um, I think this is a national issue it is not a municipal issue 
And I know you are on the front lines dealing with it, but I appreciate you taking time and sitting down and doing this and talking about this issue with me. Yeah. Well, if you, uh, if you want to come to the back side of the, of the dry area, you just come on out. I'll show you around this part of the country too. I know that medicine hat is equally as dry and, uh, you, you know, I appreciate you coming out and see, you know, visiting with Robin and, and getting some background. And so it, but you're free to come anytime. Thank you so much, Councillor Rich, for sitting down and chatting with us for the special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. To our viewers, thank you for tuning in and for being part of this conversation. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube so you can stay up to date on all our latest interviews and special episodes. Now, if you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow, produce high quality content, Every little bit helps, and we appreciate your support. A link to our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website is in the show notes. And finally, as much as we love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real-life, in-person conversations with the people in our lives, even if it's just for five minutes. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you next time on the Cross Border Interviews. Until then, remember, just keep talking.